Um, I'm excited to get to tell you some stories uh, today, and I know that the theme of the missions conference is the idea of God's story uh, around the world, and specifically today looking a little bit at uh, what it is, and in the case of Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, how it is that we are uh, uh, seeing Revelation 5-9 coming to fruition, if you may. And so um, I want to kind of set the scene for you, and, and if you've seen uh, in, in your, I'm sure, in, in some of your material and whatnot, uh, those verses in Revelation 5, 9, just kind of to give us a sense of, uh, of the context, it, it says this, and they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. If you go a couple chapters forward in Revelation 7, 9, it's interesting because uh, uh, John paints this picture of seeing uh, people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation around the throne worshiping God, and you know they're 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 giving these great words of praise to Him. Uh, but Operation Christmas Child and Samaritan's Purse, in particular, as an organization, is committed to really seeing that happen. And I know many of you probably been involved in missions or going to be involved in missions, and you're a part of that. Whether that's missions overseas or whether that's missions right here, uh, even on campus. Uh, or, or in the neighboring uh, communities, but sharing the gospel and seeing God's kingdom come uh, to fruition right where you're at. And so uh, I'm gonna take it through the context of Operation Christmas Child and share some stories with you and a little bit of what we do and how we do it. And uh, this has become my passion. This has become something that I love to do to watch literally thousands of children, if not millions of children, uh, hear the good news of Jesus and then begin their walk with Christ uh, through just the beginning stages of discipleship. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever packed a shoebox or have heard of Operation Christmas Child? Okay, so I, you know, kind of a majority here. You've heard of it. There's a few of you maybe who haven't. Um, we're kind of known as the shoebox ministry, and in the last 20 years, we've uh, we've been able to hand out over 100 million shoeboxes to children in over 120 some odd countries, and uh, our our current president is uh, Franklin Graham, the son of Dr. Billy Graham. And uh, it's just really an honor to be a part of an organization that has said at the core of who we are is the gospel, and we're not going to compromise that. Uh, in fact, if you've ever seen Franklin Graham uh, interviewed on television or the radio, you can ask him like what his favorite drink is, which is Diet Coke, and somehow he's going to bring it around to John 3.16 and that Jesus loves you and he died on the cross for you. Uh, That's how committed we are to the gospel, and somehow we're going to connect the dot between Diet Coke and John 3.16. I don't know how, but he does it somehow, and it's amazing to be able to work for an organization that says, hey, uh, we we will stand for the gospel no matter what the cost. And Operation Christmas Child is a branch of Samaritan's Purse, and it's really no different. Um, As I think of that scene in heaven... Um, I want to paint another scene for you, and I can't do it in words. I want you to see it in video. Uh, I want you to just think about the story you're about to see in the context of God's story that he's writing around the world. There's some amazing themes in this. Just take a look at it. There are stories upon stories upon stories that God wants to tell of people who have experienced hardship, who have experienced pain, who have been used and abused. And God wants to take that story and turn it into something beautiful. He wants to take that story and turn it into victory. The death toll has now risen to nearly one million dead in the small African nation of Rwanda. It looked like the devil had taken control of hearts. The spirit of death was hovering over the whole land, even where a husband would kill a wife, where parents would kill children. There was no life. There was no life. Children were scattered, like Alex. Militias who were hunting for the Tutsis in our neighborhood, they knew that my grandmother 
um, was a Tutsi and our whole family was a Tutsi, so they started, we, are, we were among the first people who were hunted down. These militias came to our house and they said, all of you kids, go back inside the house. And we were looking through the window while they tortured our grandmother to death. It wasn't strangers that just killed our grandmother. It was our neighbors who we knew by name. And then my aunt started getting sick. She's about to pass away and didn't know who would take care of me and my brother. She went across the street uh, to this orphanage called uh, Jisimba Memorial Center. We were admitted in the orphanage. Then three months later, she also dies. Personally, I was really, really angry and searching for something. Then Operation Christmas Child came in our orphanage and just having something that we could call our own, that we could play with and that could take our minds off of what happened during the war. Receiving that shoe box was just the beginning of my faith. I started to understand that, some, that the world hasn't forgotten. It reminded us that you know, someone out there cared for us. Minnesota. I love everything about Minnesota but one thing and that's the snow and the cold. The Lord would figure out a way to do it. He had prayed that the Lord would just give him one shot and um, that there was this one opportunity for him to have to get out of Rwanda. My mom, she is a testament to the love of Jesus Christ for following God's voice to be a mother to two orphans. My biological mom and my grandmother, uh, wherever they are out there in heaven, they're, you know, applauding her for what she's doing. I'm just so thankful that I'm his mom. Alex has a call in his life. I don't know what it will be. I just know it will be extraordinary. Operation Christmas Child wanted to give me that opportunity to deliver shoeboxes in the orphanage, in the same orphanage that I grew up in, and the same orphanage that I received mine. When I received that gift, I got that message of hope, which continued to answer my questions of why I was alive and I believe without a doubt that Operation Christmas Child can have a, a big part in bringing hope and love in the people of Rwanda. Your seatbelt must be tightly fastened, ready for takeoff. I felt called to be back and to help in the process of forgiveness and reconciliation because that's what the country is going for. If there's anything I can do, that's what I want to be back and help. Coming to understand that God loved me, and God loved not just me, but everybody, including those people who killed my family. Forgiveness frees the people who committed the crime by also them having peace and understanding that Christ can also forgive them. I'm trying to go to the prison to see if I can meet with the people who killed my family and to just share the message of forgiveness that uh, I've gotten to have through Jesus Christ. Pray that may continue to bless him, Lord, and just give him peace that he deserves. <laughs> Thank you for your love and your kindness. I pray that your spirit may be with him and just protect him wherever he goes, Lord, that he may have the peace that comes through you, Lord. We saw God. We saw God's love. And after Alex confessed to him that he was forgiving him, because he has trusted in Christ, he has 
known a God who is forgiving. The act was so humbling. After which they hugged each other. Man, I cried. I worshiped God in my heart and said, we still have a God that can really transform hearts. Someone may hear this story and all they hear, all they think of is, oh, poor guy, he lost everything. <laughs> I want people to have this reaction. That is a powerful God. The God who did that in my life, protected me through the war, is the God who is working in their lives, is the God who is with them each and every day, the God who is using something as simple as a shoebox to change a kid's life. We're at my orphanage that I grew up in. I received the shoebox here. So now I'm back to deliver shoeboxes. That's probably one of the most exciting things I'm gonna get a chance to do in my life. So I'm very excited. I can't wait to see them open the box. They're so excited. They were almost saying, hey, you should change that box with me. It's like, no, because the gift that they got already is destined for, the, for them. And God is going to use that box the way he wants to use it. God has already done his work. I'm, I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> I got my box in two, no, 1995. When I was very, I was like this, just like you. Yeah. <laughs> Just see the smiles on their face, just uh, the smiles that I got, that I had when I was very young. It's a blessing in itself. And it just reminds me how blessed I was when I received my, my box. We're not just hand, handing out gifts and that's it. But we follow up with the discipleship program for the greatest journey. Operation Christmas Child has continued to spread the gasp around the world using one simple box that carries a powerful message of Jesus Christ. You know, life is tough, but God is still faithful. Yeah. Uh, Alex is a good friend. And every time I watch that video, I think, man, there's just a story behind that. And I don't know if you caught it, but there's all kinds of pieces of God's story in that video in Alex's life. I mean, you see things like the issue of adoption. He was adopted, but God adopted him, right? You see the issue of forgiveness. Uh, you know, when Alex is, is sitting there with his adopted mom, he says, my birth mom and my grandma are in heaven somewhere, clapping, excited. Uh, when I was asked to share in the seminar, I, I, I needed to give a title to it, and I called it uh, 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 The Tap, or A Heavenly Tap, and, I, and I'll explain what I mean by that by the end, but when I think of uh, the reality of God's story as it unfolds and as we move towards Revelation 5-9 and Revelation 7-9, in which I hope every one of us seated or standing here today are going to hang out together and worship God in that scene uh, we're going to hang out with Alex, and we're going to hang out with his, his mom and his grandma who were, you know, who were murdered, his aunt who died, uh, maybe even that prisoner, that gentleman that killed them may join us in heaven around the throne sometime. It's kind of a crazy thought. Think about God's heart, and I put Mark 10, 14, and 15. This is one of those great verses that if you ask Operation Christmas Child people, you know, what are you about and, and why kids? It's because we believe with all our heart that God's heart is for children. It's not that it's not for the rest of, uh, of his creation, but listen to what it says. Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them. To such belongs the kingdom of God. And then he says these words. Jesus says, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Uh, all of us here today are beyond, you know, in terms of years, we're beyond the child thing, at least I hope. Uh, but God says if you are interested in the kingdom, then you better start walking around and living like a child when it comes to your humility, to your innocence, to your leaning on God. And when we get to do what we get to do with shoeboxes and then the greatest journey of discipleship, we get to see millions of kids coming into the kingdom uh, that we're going to hang out with around the throne someday. 
Uh, that's really kind of our heart, and, and if, if I were to uh, share with you, you know, why focus on kids, well, one I've already mentioned is it's really part of God's plan, it's God's heart, it's what, uh, it, it's not the only thing that God works through, of course, um, but, but he certainly is in love with kids. And Jesus got really ticked a few times, and one of those was when the kids, the children were kept away. You let them come to me, he said. And then he, he, he kind of, on top of it, says, oh, and by the way, he paraphrased, right? By the way, if you're interested in coming, you got to come like a kid. God's heart is children. And the other thing about working with kids and being about the focus on children is that they're one of the greatest ways to reach others with the gospel. There is nothing like a child sharing their newfound faith, right? There's nothing like watching a video like that. And, and I don't know, if you don't find yourself getting a little choked up when you see those kids um, you know, we can meet afterwards and pray over you or something because it's, it's like there's something about it. But kids are great for sharing their faith. Kids are great. If, you know, at your church, if there's kids, if the children are not involved, just tell your pastor here's one good reason to get children involved in the service. Have them take the offering. Your offerings will grow because kids will stand there until you pull your wallet out and put money in it because they just stand there holding the plate looking at you like they told me to collect the money and you better give something. Uh, I mean, but in all seriousness, kids are really one of the greatest ways to spread the gospel to their own parents, to their own brothers and sisters, to other family members, and I'll tell you some stories in a little bit. Our mission at Operation Christmas Child is super simple and it's stayed the same for years. And, and it's really to demonstrate God's love in a tangible way, there's your shoebox, uh, to needy children, the neediest children around the world, and then together with the local church, right, share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what I love. I've, I pastored, as they said, for some 17 plus years, and when it was time to transition, I said, God, if you take me somewhere, I want to make sure there's several things that, that th this is my heart, Lord, if you've called me to this, and that, that it's gospel-centered and that it's about the local church. Uh, Samaritan's, Samaritan's Purse is very clear. We are not the local church. God's called the local church to make a difference. Hopefully each one of you are involved in a local church. It's part of being, being the body of Christ. And, and so to work alongside the local church to bring the gospel to needy children around the world and in turn, in turn their parents and grandparents and uncles and aunts and so on, whole communities being changed. I mean, that whole idea of demonstrating God's love in a tangible way by way of a shoebox, man, there is nothing like watching a child receive a shoebox, open it up, and watch their face. A lot of people ask, what's the best thing I can put in a shoebox? And many of you raised your hands as having packed one. Let me tell you the very best thing you can put in a shoebox is a note. A personal note and your picture. I've watched hundreds if not thousands of kids open shoe boxes and they love the toys and they love the clothes and they love the school supplies. Don't quit putting that in there, but put a personal note because that becomes, hopefully not in a bad way, but it almost becomes this shrine in their, in their bedroom. I've had kids invite me into their room and all their toys that they got are broken. They've grown out of their clothes. They've used up the pencils. They may not even have the box left, but posted on the wall is a note and a picture from someone who says this, I love you, Jesus loves you, and you're beautiful. For some kids, it's the first time they've ever heard those words. You know, I think about tangibleness, and then I think about this idea of working with the local church, the idea of saying, as I've already mentioned, that this is the body of Christ, and we want to come alongside you and empower you as a local church to be about the business of sharing the gospel. And so when shoeboxes go out, uh, shoeboxes don't go into the hands of kids that already know Jesus most of the time. We want it, it, it to be focused on kids that have never heard the gospel. And so churches use this opportunity, and we call them gospel opportunities. We don't even call them shoeboxes anymore. We call them gospel opportunities because every one of those is an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus to kids who have never heard and in turn their families being impacted. And that idea of sharing the good news of Jesus comes in a couple of different ways. Uh, the shoebox, of course, is this tangible demonstration, and at a, at a distribution, if you ever get to see one or witness one, uh, before kids even get a shoebox, they hear the gospel. Uh, it's presented in a child-friendly way. It's an opportunity for them to hear the gospel, for us to have a captive audience, and then when it's all said and done in terms of the kids hearing the gospel and having an opportunity to respond, then we say, and guess what? We have a really cool thing that we want to share with you, a, real, uh, 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 a way you can touch a little bit of God's love, and it's a gift that came from far away, and it's a shoebox, and then we pull them out. You get to watch about 200 kids gasp. It's an amazing thing to see. <laughs> 
and witness. But as kids hear the gospel, then they're going to hear it again through the greatest journey, discipleship. And that's kind of how, for us, we're moving towards Revelation 5, 9 and Revelation 7, 9 and being part of God's story literally in, in over 100 nations around the world. And if you're curious how it all began, I only want to take a second and kind of share this with you. Uh, Operation Christmas Child literally began uh, back in 1990 uh, over in, in uh, the country of Wales with a family that wanted to pack some shoe boxes with gifts for children in war-torn Bosnia. And they called up uh, Franklin Graham after a year or so, realizing this is getting bigger than us, and they asked if if Smyrna's Purse, if Franklin would help them by getting some more shoe boxes. And, and uh, he tells the story that, that in the first phone call he said, sure, call me back when you need them. And he kind of forgot about it. And then several months later, his secretary said, we got someone on the phone who says you promised them shoe boxes. And he's like, oh, oh, yeah. And so he calls a friend in Charlotte and uh, a pastor friend, and uh, within a short amount of time, they end up with some 10,000 plus shoe boxes headed over there. And in, in, in only a few years, it, it really exploded and uh, became something very gospel centered. In 1993, it became official at Samaritan's Purse. And uh, there's about 11 countries that send gifts now. The United States is not the only one. And, uh, and, and since that time, the last 20 years, I already mentioned over 100 million gospel opportunities going into over 120 countries. Uh, just this last season, right now, as we're sitting here, um, there are shoeboxes having arrived or arriving in over 100 countries, uh, uh, just under 10, or just at about 10 million shoeboxes around the world just this season. Uh, it's, it's crazy what God's doing through this simple, tangible demonstration of God's love. Again, as God's story is just kind of being unfolded. And, and we see it as every box, a gospel opportunity, every box, a kid having a chance to, to hear the gospel. And so we work really hard. We're not perfect at it, but we work really hard to make sure that these boxes are going into those kids' hands. We make it pretty clear to pastors and church leaders, hey, listen, we're not Santa Claus coming in providing you with free gifts uh, for your congregation. Uh, these are to be used for the gospel. Uh, and so I'm just going to tell you along the way as, as I share a little bit of this, would you, if you're a pray, prayer, would you pray that God would continue to work and move in huge ways uh, through the ministry of Operation Christmas Child? Uh, literally millions of kids hear the gospel, and I believe, we believe that literally millions have come to Jesus in the last 20 years. That's crazy, because you know what? Revelation 5.9, Revelation 7.9 says someday those of us who are God's children are going to hang out around his throne, like I've mentioned several times, and, and there's going to be a bunch more because of a ministry like this, because of the commitment to the gospel. And along the way, in, in sharing something like this with you, I hope that you take away a challenge. Not, not just maybe you'll, you'll, you'll pack an extra shoebox, you'll get involved um, in, in other ways with Operation Christmas Child, but even more so than that, that you'd ask yourself, how am I a part of God's story? How am I, in the world that I influence, in my sphere of influence, how am I being a part of of seeing people uh, populate uh, that area around the throne someday when people from every tribe and every tongue and every nation worship God together. Well, if I were to share kind of the journey of a shoebox, I just it can blow through this, but I want, you, I want you to see how this all happens for a minute. How are we doing it? How are we making sure that Revelation 5.9 is, is moving forward and, and becoming a reality? Uh, well, it all starts in the hands, oftentimes, of another child. Uh, I have three boys, uh, a 15-year-old, a, a 5-year-old, and a 3-year-old. In this last season, we packed 13 boxes as a family. And, and, and uh, when we were all done, we piled the boxes on our couch. And I'll never forget watching my little 3-year-old son lay his hands on a couple of boxes and bow his head. And all of us as a family prayed over those boxes. Because we believe that every single box has a des destination. God prepares them. God's just kind of crazy that, ra that way. He's amazing. And, and I'll tell you stories in just a few minutes of how God, in, in supernatural, miraculous ways, has put the right box in the right hands of the right child somewhere in the world. 
But that's where it all begins, and maybe in a living room or maybe in a classroom, maybe you right here at Biola on this campus, you do a packing party sometime, it all starts there, and then those boxes are taken uh, to collection centers around the country, to relay centers, to other churches, and then they end up in a processing center where, where we have a chance to just double check that the box has all the items that are appropriate, uh, and, and, and so we go through it just to make sure we don't take things out uh, that, that have been put there with great care unless there's something that you know, might melt, uh, might, might cause trouble. We, we, you know, there's certain items that we avoid, soldiers, not a great deal to take uh, little toy soldiers in a shoebox over to South Sudan or the Middle East. Uh, so things like that. But then we fill it in even more if there's a little space left and we process those boxes and we tape them up. We make sure that the boys and the girls are in separate cartons. All this stuff that happens at processing centers, over eight processing centers around the country. And it's crazy in this short amount of time processing millions of shoe boxes. And then they get on these, in these containers. And in this last season, not this one that we're in right now where, where shoe boxes went out in December, but the year before that, uh, so back in December of 2012, uh, we made a calculation in terms of the distance that containers, all the containers, uh, went around the world. And we added all those distances that, that these over a thousand containers two seasons ago went all around the world. And what we came up with, at least our logistics department came up with, is that those distances added up to uh, one trip to the moon and back again twice. Uh, that's how far-reaching, if you took all those containers and you broke it out by shoeboxes and these millions of shoeboxes where they went, it's, it's insane uh, where these things end up. Uh, while all this is happening, we have national leadership teams, and it's all volunteer-based. That's what's nuts, uh, is that these people all around the world, literally around the world, say, I want to be a part of God's story in this way, and I will serve whatever it takes to make sure that the gospel gets into the hands of children and they have a chance to grow in their faith through discipleship. And so we have national leadership teams in each one of these countries that volunteer their time to um, prepare the way. And they're, they're training volunteers, they're training teachers for the greatest journey, they're training churches and pastors in how to go about presenting the gospel. Unbelievable amounts of work is going uh, on overseas while all the boxes are getting prepared here. And then that container or two containers or 60 containers arrive in port uh, in, in whatever country it's going to, and, uh, and, and our logistics coordinator, a volunteer man or woman in each country, uh, kind of spearheads getting those cleared. And here's the amazing thing. A lot of people don't know this, but Operation Christmas Child will not ship shoeboxes into a country if we have to pay taxes uh, on them because they're a donation. So can you believe that this year in over 100 countries, we're, we're bringing uh, containers of shoeboxes in and not paying any tax? Uh, God grants us favor with presidents and prime ministers and finance ministers and whatnot in all these countries to grant us exoneration. Uh, and that's an amazing, amazing feat in and of itself. And then, you know, when I think about how the shoebox gets into the hands of kids, uh, these pictures are, are, are four in, in hundreds of them. You, you, Pick, pick a way that you can imagine, the craziest way you can imagine for a carton of shoeboxes to arrive at its destination, and it's probably happened. Uh, on the back of a yak, uh, on the back of a person, uh, in a dugout canoe, uh, helicopters, planes, uh, I mean, just, just kind of name it, uh, and somehow they, they get where they're going. Uh, in, in the northern part of Peru, uh, we have some of the indigenous tribes, unreached people groups in northern Peru receiving shoeboxes, and uh, literally, they'll put these cartons that you see kind of, again, tied or uh, on, a, on a boat, these cartons of shoeboxes, they'll put them on a canoe, and that canoe will go three days upriver into villages, and the kids will hear the gospel and receive this tangible demonstration and then have a chance to be discipled too, some of them in places that uh, are, don't even have their language developed, and so we do it through orality. Uh, we do it just through pictures and storytelling. Uh, getting to the farthest reaches of the earth, uh, and then ultimately into the hands and heart of a child. This little boy uh, holding the box on the right-hand side here is a young man in Columbia that um, uh, about three years ago, a little, little under three years ago, made his way uh, through the jungles of Columbia with his mom to uh, an outreach event. 
Shoebox distribution is as he came into to the event, he was dragging his foot, kind of stumbling along, and uh, one of the leaders at the event was concerned that he had injured himself, so he went up to the mom and said, is your son okay? And she explained, well, we had just, uh, we've just walked a couple of days. We knew that this event was going on. We heard it's really special. And no, my son's not injured. He was born with deformed feet. And this is how he's walked all his life. So uh, the event happened, and as I described, it begins really with the gospel. It begins with a child-friendly uh, gospel uh, presentation, or maybe music, puppets, mime, you name it. Many of you have probably done it on some missions trips, but being about uh, re- being relevant to kids. And then, and then afterwards, we pass out the shoeboxes, and so this young boy received a shoebox. Mind you, this random shoebox out of some eight million that season from around the world, he gets this shoebox placed in his lap. All it says on it is, boy five to nine. And then we do this countdown. We go tres, dos, uno, depends on what uh, language it's in. We don't do Spanish everywhere, only where they speak it. Um, Requirements, Spanish everywhere, deal with it. Um, I mean, it is the language of heaven. Let's just, uh, you know, when you get there, God will say, hola, como estas? Um, uh, Anyways, don't quote me on that. because I might not get there. Uh, but anyways, uh, so we count down, tres, dos, uno, and we make the kids wait right until that. So you got 200 kids at times, maybe a few more, hanging onto these boxes, trembling like, oh my gosh, I can't open it. And finally everyone has one, and we count down in whatever language it is, and this little boy opens his box. And sitting on top is a pair of orthopedic shoes his size. Now you explain to me how that happens. He just heard the greatest news of his life, that Jesus loves him, that Jesus thought of him before the creation of the earth, that Jesus has offered a personal relationship with him. And on top of it, just to back it up, just to confirm how much Jesus loves him, he made sure that this young boy receives a shoebox with a pair of orthopedic shoes his size. I've gotten to share about OCC around the country, and every time I ask for someone please to raise their hand and tell me that they pack orthopedic shoes in their boxes, and no one has raised their hand. That's kind of how crazy and amazing and supernatural our God is and how personal he is. That little boy left that day having heard the best news of his life about Jesus and walking pretty normal for the first time. That's just kind of the way God works and how he unfolds his story. When it's all done, and a lot of people don't realize this, kids get their shoebox, they hear the gospel, and, and then they get an invitation to come back the following week and start what we call the greatest journey which is three months, 12 weeks of walking through the Word of God. Uh, They start by learning uh, the gospel again and reading it and seeing it in pictures for the first four weeks. And then they go into just some very basics about what it is to walk with Christ, walk with God. And then their last four weeks, they spend time learning how to share their testimony, how to pray for their friends, and and hopefully begin to see them become agents of mission and, and, and little missionaries. Because you know what? If you teach a child that's seven or eight years old to share their faith with a seven or eight-year-old, who do you think they're going to share their faith with when they're 30, 40, and 50? A 30, 40, or 50-year-old. Because they understand that their calling is to share the gospel with those around them. Your calling is to share the gospel with those around you. Your calling, even greater than your studies, is to be about the gospel uh, wherever God's planted you. Uh, maybe here on campus, maybe it's the, uh, the checkout at the grocery store, maybe it's at work, whatever it is, that is part of your calling. And so we believe that passionately with our kids that we get to spend time with. Well, I want to show you what OCC is doing in one country uh, pretty close by, uh, pretty close by. This video is one of our newest as we share a little bit of what God's doing just south of the border here in Mexico. <laughs> Guadalajara, Mexico, 150 kids to 200 kids are going to be blessed through Operation Christmas Child. These kids live in extreme poverty, and without this blessing, it's so much harder to get to these kids, but through a shoebox, we get to tell them how much Jesus loves them, and we're just so excited about what's going to happen today. We are 
here in Donala, Eriberto. We are opening the doors to bring the gospel here, and we are so happy to do that. We're going to have a big party. Teniendo estos regalos, estas hermosas cajas, nos da la oportunidad de compartir el Evangelio a los niños. Una de las razones por la que mi vida es entregada a estos niños o jóvenes de la calle es porque yo puedo reflejar mi vida en la vida de ellos. Cuando yo tenía seis años, empecé a vivir en las calles. Mi razón no era drogarme, era trabajar para ayudar a mi mamá, como muchos niños que yo conozco. Pero poco a poco sentía miedo, sentía frío, eh, me sentía solo. Y como a los siete años empecé a usar las drogas. Es la misma historia que se repite con los niños que, que vamos a estos lugares. Entonces, cuando damos la cajita de regalos, empieza a haber una esperanza para ellos y dejan de usar las drogas, la violencia, los robos y empiezan a llenarlo con el amor de Dios. Pero cuando Jesús viene a sus corazones, sus vidas son transformadas. It's more than just a shoebox. Through the greatest journey, we're able to give the kids the tools to reach their community, their schools, and even their nation. This is the first time in Guadalajara that we have this program, The Greatest Journey. And it's important for us because after we are teaching the, each lesson, we start to see how the kids are start to changing. And the material they help unto us because they came in their own language and they can understand in their own words what Jesus did for them. Hemos experimentado como a través del discipulado la vida de miles de niños han sido cambiadas. Creo que nunca había, uh, uh, nunca había visto un ejército tan grande de niños compartiendo el amor del Señor Jesucristo en, en todo México. Today we have the graduation here in Guadalajara. The kids, they can show us in their face, their happiness and their joy because they finished the all lessons. Yo aprendí cuando hizo Dios el mundo. It helps them know how much Jesus loves them. And they're able to tell to their neighbors, to their families, to their friends, to their schools. La graduación para mí fue otro paso más para mi vida. What's really cool is we're seeing kids hear the gospel. Kids uh, begin to grow in their faith. Discipleship is a lifelong journey, right? Discipleship is doing life together. So I don't, we wouldn't claim that 12 weeks you got a disciple, but you got someone on their way. And they start becoming who Jesus is calling them to be. And as they grow up, many of them become teachers of the greatest journey. In fact, the young lady interviewed there received a shoebox and, and, and was discipled. And, and, and as she has now grown up, she's turning around doing the same thing. It's pretty amazing to watch what God's doing. 
You know, I have the privilege of being uh, over the Americas and the Caribbean and just providing some leadership there with an amazing team. And I just want to tell you, it, it, what God's doing in the last few years is, is exponential. I'm not really here to, to talk a bunch of numbers. I really want, hopefully, to, for you to catch the heart of God and the story of God and particularly how it's happening through Operation Christmas Child. Uh, what is staggering to me is how when you multiply, uh, God blesses that. And, and as we bring in this season over 2 million gospel opportunities just this year alone into the Americas and almost a million kids going through the greatest journey, that, that for us, that looks like this. We're going to train or we have trained 40,000 teachers in the Americas uh, to, to, to invest and pour their lives into children. And, and then we expect, again, enrollment of over 850,000 kids. And, I, and again, I'm not, I'm not here to go, for you to go, whoa, those are big numbers. Uh, it, you know, at the end of the day, it's one kid at a time. At the end of the day, it's us sharing one time the gospel with those who need Jesus. And so the question mark is how many of them uh, will, will give their life to Christ uh, will we'll become transformed by God's amazing work in their lives. You know, I think about this in the context, again, of the scene that we, that we read about at the beginning, uh, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This last season in Yodo, Honduras, a little five-year-old boy was brought to a distribution by his mom and dad. What was unique about Anthony was that his dad had to hold him in his arms because Anthony didn't have the strength to walk because Anthony had a, a, a very serious lung disease. But mom and dad wanted him to be a part of this, and so uh, during the uh, program, he was able to listen and, and, and really take in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, one of the most special moments of that day was when uh, the person sharing the gospel at the end said, how many of you children, now that you've heard this message of what Jesus has done for you, would like to surrender your life to Jesus? Would you just raise your hand? And off to the side, you saw little Anthony laying in the arms of his dad, raised his hand. Dad didn't raise his hand for him. He raised his hand on his own. Anthony gave his life to Jesus that day, and Anthony then received a shoebox and, of course, loved it. In fact, you know what he loved the most about his shoebox were the two red matchbox cars. Uh, like any normal five-year-old boy, I have one. It's all about cars and trucks and all that cool boy stuff. And he loved these two Matchbox cars. Um, and uh, over the course of the next week, he played and played. And then as God's timing would be, uh, he became very, very ill with this lung infection and was taken into the hospital. He was placed in a, in a crib for a child his size and monitored. And as the days ticked by, Anthony continued to worsen. And it's as if he knew that God was doing something, and he asked his mom and dad, uh, in Spanish, of course, he said, would you bring me that book that tells the story of my best friend? And could I also have those two cars? So mom and dad went home and brought back what we call the greatest gift. It's a little booklet that is illustrated and tells the gospel through the eyes of the Apostle John. And, and every, every uh, child, when they receive their shoebox, they also get that book. And so uh, Anthony grabbed that book, they said, as they, they wrote this story to me. Uh, he grabbed that book and he held it very close. And he had those two cars in each hand. And later on that day, Anthony went home to be with his heavenly daddy. And he passed away. And as is the custom in many countries, uh, there was a viewing uh, just a, a day later, uh, open casket, and as people walked by to pay their uh, love and respects to little five-year-old Anthony. Uh, he was holding the greatest gift and his two matchbox cars. And that's how he was buried. You know, it's interesting when I think of uh, the scene that will happen in heaven someday, I am so excited to get to meet Anthony. And I believe with all my heart, Anthony is going to come running up to whoever packed that shoebox. He's going to come running up to that uh, faithful leader who shared the good news of Jesus Christ. And you know what he's going to do? He's going to tap them on the shoulder. 
I just kind of imagine this in my mind's eye, that he's going to tap them. There's that heavenly tap piece. He's going to tap them while we're all worshiping and praising uh, our amazing King of Kings, and he's going to tap them, and they're going to turn around, and he's, he's going to say, I just want to say thank you for obeying what God called you to do. And I think of the little girl in Veracruz, Mexico, who uh, this last season, if you're familiar with uh, Mexico, there's sections of Mexico that are extremely violent and, and really dangerous uh, to this day. And in the, in the hills outside of the city of Veracruz, up in the mountains of Veracruz, um, one of these sections, a violent and rather dangerous area, in this last season, um, shoeboxes were taken in and the gospel was presented. About 200 children. Uh, what happened was kind of amazing because as uh, 200 kids gathered, this, this young 13-year-old girl walks up uh, clearly incredibly poor. I mean, poorest of the poor. You just know from looking at her, her dress or lack thereof and, and the tattered clothes and whatnot. And what struck the, the leaders there was that she was carrying this probably two or three-month-old little boy. It, she just... She just kind of caught their attention, so they drew close to her and they said, honey, do you want us to hold uh, your little brother while, we, uh, uh, while you participate? And she's like, no, this is not my brother. Uh, this is my son, and I'll hold him, but thank you. So as I've described several times, uh, she heard the gospel and uh, was able to hear the good news of Jesus, and then she received her shoebox. And mind you, I tell you these stories because I hope you catch in all this God's story being written around the world, and this is just one way that it's being written, because the reality is he's writing a story in each one of your lives. And so she received her shoebox, one of some nine million, right, random, not, uh, sitting on her lap, box, all it says is girl 10 to 14. They set it on her lap and up in the mountains of Veracruz with 200 other kids, and they do the countdown. See, I told you that it's in Spanish. You saw it on the video, just confirming. Now, they did it out of order, one, two, three. I'll get with them on that. Never let that happen again. It's three, two, one. I'm kidding. Um, however it happens, they, she, she opens the box, and uh, it, it, they kind of were keeping an eye on her because she had struck them, and uh, it's just being an amazing situation. And they watched as after just a few seconds, she began to weep uncontrollably. And they thought, oh, no. So, so one of them drew closer, and they, they just said, honey, is, is everything okay? And she said, yes, and she's nodding her head. She's just weeping, and they said, Are, is there something that's really special in the box? And she nods her head, and she pulls out the note. Remember I told you about the note? Always write a note, put your picture. She pulls out the note, and they said, oh, I know. Isn't that amazing that someone you don't even know packed this box and said, I love you, and that Jesus loves you? And she's just shaking her head like you don't get it. When she finally kind of gets her tears under control, she, uh, she says, five years ago, my uncle and aunt and their children disappeared. And around here, if someone disappears, the assumption is they were kidnapped and or killed. And so my mom and I have assumed that they were gone, that they were dead. And she took the card and she flipped it over to a picture on the other side and she said, this is my uncle and aunt, and this is their children. And she flipped it back over, and there's an address in the United States. What in the world? I mean, seriously, out of some nine million shoeboxes, God, the God of the universe, this amazing God that someday we're going to worship together, goes, this box is going into the hands of the niece of the family that disappeared, and somehow he's going to get it to her. Because that's the kind of God we serve. That's the kind of amazing, miraculous story that happens repeated thousands, if not millions of times around the world. And again, in a myriad of ways, the context I'm telling you is in the context of children and tangible ways of saying Jesus loves you, that of a gospel opportunity like a shoebox. I think of the little boy Carlos uh, and again, I'm giving you stories from the Americas, but you could repeat these from all over the world, uh, who uh, went through uh, the greatest journey uh, in, in, in Ecuador. He went through the greatest journey, and uh, he was uh, in the midst of uh, going through it some uh, 11 weeks into it when um, he died of a brain aneurysm. He was 12 years old. 
See, the catch with Carlos, though, is that he was the only member of his family that had ever really responded to the spiritual uh, call, to the story of Jesus, uh, to the gospel, and everyone else was involved in the darkest and, and, and worst stuff you can imagine. And little Carlos faithfully went to church. He'd been invited to every week, and he'd come home, and he'd try to tell his mom and dad about this best friend he found named Jesus, and they just rejected and rejected and rejected. And then in the 11th week of the greatest journey, Carlos dies suddenly of a brain aneurysm, completely unexpected, and what does mom do? Mom goes running to the church and says, you are the only people who brought hope to my son. Would you help us, please? And the pastor said, absolutely, and he shared the gospel with mom, and literally that afternoon, mom gave her life to Jesus Christ, and she said this, she said, at the funeral, would you do the funeral, do you have any banners that say uh, Operation Christmas Child or The Greatest Journey or something that says what you do? And, and, and of course, the pastor said, well, actually, we do, we have a banner, and she goes, drape it over his coffin, because I want every guest, and, and, and the, what I was told is that pretty much every guest was like the, the darkest, roughest bunch in town. I want every guest, when they see my son's uh, casket, to uh, be directed to what brought him hope, and that's Jesus Christ. That's how the gospel is kind of repeating itself all around. Um, I, I think of the kids, kind of the miracle stories of the, of, of the uh, orthopedic shoes. I think of the little kid in Africa who opens his box after the countdown, you know, right in the middle of hot, sweaty Africa. He opens the box and sitting on top is a pair of ski gloves because that's what you want in Africa because there's a lot of skiing, right? I mean, it's one of those, uh, they, they, the, the leaders that were there said they panicked. They're like, oh my gosh, half the box was filled with these big old ski gloves. You know, do we exchange the gifts? Do we give them something better? But he wouldn't let go of the ski gloves. He was so excited. He's like the kids in that first video, they're just giggling. He's so excited with these ski gloves. He's screaming that he got these ski gloves, and they're like, why are you, you know what these are? Do you have a clue what you're holding? And he nods his head and he says yes and he rolls up his sleeves and he shows his arms on both sides and his hands are totally burned and scarred. He says my mom's business is cooking. She has big clay pots and my responsibility is to pick them up off the fire and move them off to the side. And God gave me protection. I've been praying for it. Now you tell me that's not an amazing God that goes, you know, someday we're going to hang out with these kids in heaven. Someday, maybe even for some of you, if you've been a part of this uh, in, in some way, or, or I'm sure you've, many of you have shared the gospel in other ways, because Operation Christmas Child isn't the only way. Uh, it's a cool way, but it's not the only way. Whatever it is, but when you get around the throne in Revelation 7, 9, when you join the crowd there, when I join the crowd there, there's going to be a bunch of heavenly taps going on. I think there's gonna be long lines. It's like worship, tap. And people are gonna turn around and go, do I know you? Isn't this amazing? And, and, and you're gonna have someone say, hey, I just wanna say thank you. Thanks for sacrificing and, and, and helping me hear the good news of Jesus. Thanks for being a part of God's story in my life. And I guess that's the challenge for you today is what part are you playing in God's story? How is it that you're uh, being about that business in the midst of studying, in the midst of work, in the midst of relationships? How are you doing that? Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, that's really all that matters. There's a German proverb that says the main thing is that the main thing always be the main thing. It's pretty simple. Jesus is the main thing. The gospel is the main thing. I'll just end with this story and uh, let you go. I just think about um, uh, the little girl that I was able to hand a shoebox to uh, in Dominican Republic uh, when I first started. It was my first distribution ever. I kind of got baptized by fire because my first distribution ever happened to have as my guest, uh, my boss, Franklin Graham. Uh, that creates a little bit of uh, heightened awareness when the boss is in town and not in the sense that uh, we, we certainly want to do our very best all the time, but we want to really make sure that he has a chance to see what God's doing through the boxes. And wouldn't you know, the first distribution has Franklin Graham there, and we had 500 kids, not 200, and another 500 standing outside. 
for a second distribution in a minute. And, and so it was just one of those chaotic, get it all ready, make it, you know, make it special for the kids ultimately, and they hear the gospel. And as I'm standing translating, I see this little two-year-old, two, three, she couldn't have been more than three-year-old girl sitting up front, and she was not smiling. Now, I don't know about you, but I remember as a kid, if, if I was a part of something like this, you just can't help but smile. But she would not smile, so there's clowns, there's great music, it's upbeat, kids are jumping around, doing actions, there's all this fun, and the kids are laughing and having a great time. She never smiled. And so I just kind of kept my eye on her, and as the time went by, the gospel was presented, and kids were given a chance to uh, respond, and then we talked about the shoeboxes, and kids are giggling and screaming. Imagine 500 screaming, giggling kids. It was amazing. She is not smiling. I'm like, oh my gosh, what is this child's story? So I told myself, God, can I maybe give her a box? Maybe, can we arrange for that? And my, my charge was to translate for the children of some guests we had with us. And so um, I, I thought, okay, when it's time to give out the boxes, I'm gonna give a box to her and I'm gonna take, drag these kids with me whether they want to or not because I wanna know why she's not smiling. So we, we walk over and we give her this box and you know, we wait, three, two, one, open the box. She opens the box and I kid you not, she is still not smiling. And, and literally, I just thought, God, what is the tragedy in this little one's life? And so I got down right in front of her, and I said, in Spanish, I said, are, are you okay? And she just kind of looked at me blank, and I said, let's, let's look at what's in this box. And I'm pulling out these uh, little toys and whatnot, this and that, and, and not cracking a smile, just looking at it. And finally, I pull out the note, and I said, can I tell you what this note says? Because this lady wrote a note to you. She nods her head. And God ordained the time because I translated that note and it said this. Uh, Dear friend, my name is, and they gave their name, and I packed this box because I want you to know a few things. I want you to know, first of all, that Jesus loves you. And I want you to know that he gave his life for you and I love you too. And then it said this. It said it's also really important that you know that you are his beautiful creation. And she began to smile, just on the edges. And it hit me. I don't know that she's ever been told that she's beautiful. So I got right down, and I'm like, I got these two poor innocent kids that don't speak a lick of Spanish standing next to me not knowing what's going on, and I got tears running down my eyes, and I look at her and I say, honey, I want you to know that the Bible says that God thought of you before he even created the earth, and he loves you, and you are beautiful, and she started smiling more and more, and the more I said you are beautiful, the more she smiled, and I thought, wow, you know what, someday, I hope, that little two or three-year-old is going to join us around the throne. And I know she'll be smiling because she'll understand that she is God's beautiful creation. As are you, as am I, because God thought of us before the foundations of the earth. And he yearns to write his story through us. So I just want to thank you for your time today. Let me pray for us. God, thank you so much that you are on the move. Thank you for each individual here today and their lives. Thank you for your goodness to us and the opportunity to be about the greatest gift of all, which is Jesus. Uh, I pray that you just show each one of us where you've called us, what specifically we can do, again, to continue to be a part of your story. God, thanks for thinking of us and loving us, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.